Hey, what's up, folks? James from Junkyard Fox. Thank you so much for joining me. And today we have a very exciting video. It's been a long time coming. So I want to have a large summary on a ton of these wild desert plants that we've discussed in the past. So there's not a lot of information when it comes to wild desert edibles and not only edibles, but other plants that have for example, medicinal uses or other uses such as soap, things like that. So we've been doing this for about nine years and we've covered a ton of plants in, in previous videos. But a lot of those videos are either pretty dated in terms of production or I just wasn't as ex experienced doing this as I am now. So once again, we're just going to have a big summary on a lot of these wild edibles and what their uses are. So thank you for joining me. Let's get started. So starting off with the easily most identifiable and abundant plant out here in the American Southwest, which is the prickly pear cactus. This thing has so many uses, primarily as a food source. So these pads, when they're young and tender, they are edible. They're called nopales in Mexican culture. They're thrown in stews and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, they're not my favorite type of food to eat, but they are edible. So they're a staple in the Southwestern food culture. Now, once again, they are best when they're young and tender. They Those grow around early springtime. These are still technically edible, though they're gonna be very fibrous, very tasteless. So eventually during the summertime, these grow some food flowers which are also edible and those flowers become fruits those fruits are called tunas they're these vibrant purple sometimes they're orange sometimes they're green these bulb type fruits and those are edible as well they are probably the most delicious sweet food out here in the desert that once again grows around summertime not only that but of course you can take them home we have made them into drinks you can turn them into candy into jellies stuff like that and yeah that's an edible food source as well not only the nopales but the tunas which are the cactus fruit now outside of a food source these can also be used as a container so if you can manage to find yourself a large pad that's undamaged find yourself something pretty large and you can cut that scrape off the thorns char some of the thorns out with some fire and then hollow this out it's a very slow going process you want to be very patient when doing that but you can prop that open get some water say from a stream or a puddle and then stone boil that water. And so what that does is when you're stone boiling, it's killing off all the protozoa, all the bacteria that's in that water. So it makes it safe for you to drink. If, once again, if you did not have some kind of container on you and you're, say you're stranded out here in the desert. And lastly, there's something of a first aid medicinal use to this plant. It's very slimy on the inside. The cactus slime is what we call it. I believe it's technically called mucilage. And that stuff is useful, something like aloe vera. So you're out here in the field and you got scrapes, you got bug bites, you got sunburn, anything like that. You get some of that slime and you, you know, you coat your skin on it. As long as it's not a very severe, you know, third degree burn, you know, this is not gonna help you. But once again, for the slight cuts and stings and scrapes, this is gonna provide you a little bit of some medicinal relief. So not only is it a food source, but it can provide an improvised container and a little bit of first aid as well. So this right here is called the Acatillo plant. And these are also very easily identifiable. They grow like long spindly fingers from the ground and they're covered in thorns. It's hard for you to see the thorns right now because they're covered in leaves. Normally throughout the year, it's very bare their limbs but because we recently had some rains they sprout these little leaves and then the leaves quickly fall off and it's bare and then it rains again and right away they, they grow leaves again but for the most part it's very bare with a ton of little thorns because of course everything out here has spikes now the usefulness of this plant is during the early summertime at the very tops they will sprout some vibrant red beautiful flowers very pretty and you can take those flowers steep it in some hot water so you can make yourself tea now, a second attribute of this plant that I find extremely interesting, maybe it's not that usable in the short-term survival, but in long-term survival, I think it's something to consider. Uh, say you're out here homesteading or something like that, is the old-time ranchers and farmers that were poor, what they would do is they would take some of these limbs and chop them up, and then they would plant them into the ground, many next to each other, water them and eventually they would grow roots so eventually they would make something of a living fence so if you wanted to enclose an area away from rabbits say you're growing a garden this is an excellent thing to do once again maybe not so useful in the short term but in the long term if you have property out here something like that you can make a living fence out of these guys and now for the stinkiest plant out here in the southwest that's easily going to go to the buffalo gourd 
this plant and fruit right here. They look like little tennis balls. It's now early autumn, so they're dry, they're yellow, but during early summertime, they look vibrant green like little watermelons, and that's because they are in the watermelon family. But do not be a fool, do not eat them. These are extremely potent in bitterness. You will puke, you will get the runs, it's not worth it. Uh, this, th this stuff will make you sick. I would avoid eating these at all completely. Now, if you had to in an emergency, you can collect the seeds from these. If you take the time to remove the pulp, rinse them, dry them for a couple of months, you can go back and eat them a couple of months later. I've done that before. They're rather tasteless, something like sunflower seeds. Uh, and there's even reports that some tribes would collect those seeds and mush them down to make something like a flower substitute. I've not gone that far with it, but I've eaten the seeds. They're fine. But once again, you got to make sure you do a thorough job cleaning them or else they're going to be still be very bitter and very disgusting. So I generally avoid this as a food source. However, it can be used as a soap. These do have the chemical compound of saponins, particularly in the roots and the leaves. And these are the leaves. These triangle shaped leaves what I've done is I've, I've rinsed these in water crushed them mixed them and it turns into a green liquid looks like green Gatorade and it's gonna have once again sap in it so it's a very weak soap mixture it will help feel a little cleaner and that's about it other than that I mean if you really are out here living completely primitive once these dry out you can carve a hole in them and kind of empty out what's inside and you can use these as improvised containers to carry something um but i mean there's not a lot of uses for this other than once again this is an extreme emergency when it comes to seeds if there's nothing else to eat and uh the soap if there's no other forms of soap which i can find stronger better smelling soaps out here in the desert so not a lot of uses but something to take note for the buffalo gourd and now let's talk about the MVP of desert survival plants. And we're gonna talk about this beauty right here, the yucca. Now there are countless species of yucca found all throughout the American Southwest, even in this area. But I'm generally gonna speak about this one right here, known as the banana yucca or the Spanish dagger yucca. And this one has the most uses. It's the most resourceful, even beating out the prickly pear cactus. Now, first things first, let's discuss food. Just like the cactus, it starts blooming early springtime. This pod at the center of the plant starts growing. This purple alien looking little pod, cut that up, boil it, eat it. It tastes like cabbage, not the most appetizing, a little bitter, but it's a food source. You can you know, put some butter on it, cook it up. If you leave that pot to keep growing, it starts stemming out to grow into white flowers. They're also a food source as well. And if you keep letting those grow, those flowers eventually become this collection of green pods, these leathery green pods. The inside is edible. You can bake those fruits. And the inside has these white corn kernel seeds that are edible. Get them young enough, bake them. And once again, they taste like corn kernels. Uh, somewhat flavorless, but at least it's not as bitter as the flowers or the pod. Some folks like in Arizona have mentioned that if they bake their yucca fruits, they taste sweet. I've never had them tasting sweet, so I'm just guessing it's all a matter of, you know, different geographies and, and water levels and stuff like that that's going to affect the flavor. So, you know, you're going to want to taste the ones in your area. Other than a food source, this also helps you with crafting, building things. So that same stock that grew those pods, eventually it dries out and you get some very large, long, pretty sturdy stalks. At least for the first couple of years, they're pretty sturdy before they become brittle. You can gather those with three good sized ones. You can make yourself an improvised teepee with a tarp. Or if you get a large amount of those stalks, like I have before, I have actually made a primitive shelter mostly out of yucca stalks. And it's a sturdy shelter. I have a video on that if you wanna check that out up in the corner. Not only did I use that to make the framework of the building, but these spikes right here, you can remove them, pound them down, and then start stripping them, and you can make some cordage out of them. Not only of these yuccas, but other yuccas as well, like soap tree yucca. That's also another one that's very easy to manage, and you can twist it, and you make yourself some primitive cordage. Very tough stuff. You can actually build other things as well. For example, I've used some of the smaller stocks, and I've used them to make a figure four deadfall trap. So you make some notches on them, you make a trap so you can capture small games, such as small rodents or rabbits. I've also carved 
a spatula from one before in the past. I still have that spatula to this day. And of course, if you're a more of a primitive outdoorsman, such as my buddy Shane, he uses a lot of these to make sets for bow drills and hand drills to make those primitive fire techniques. I'm not quite there yet. I'm not as proficient with that stuff. But once again, I know that a lot of folks do like to use yucca as it's a somewhat of a soft wood. So it's easy to burn down. It's so many uses. In fact, there were some Native American tribes in this region that used to get these stalks and they used to weave with them and they used to make sandals. Now that's far beyond my skill level, so I have never done that. But yeah, you could see some folks that they would weave them together and they would make some pretty sturdy sandals for traversing this area. And of course, everything out here is out to stab you. So you really wanna take care of your feet. Also towards the bottom, you will find a lot of these dead stalks and it's very fibrous. You bunch that up and you can make yourself a little primitive tinder bundle. If you're wanting to make a fire, say, you know, with a bow drill or something like that, or you just need something going with your lighter to get a fire going. So it's good tinder material as well. And then last of all is the roots of these yucca, not just this yucca, but the soap tree yucca and many other species. In fact, pretty much all yucca species in your area, uh, you dig up the root clean it up and you have a form of soap with it and that's what the natives in the area would use it you've seen it in my channel before is you get that you shave off the pieces with your knife you mix it with some water or even if you have to your spit and you start seeing some suds and that's because it contains the chemical compound called saponins which is where soap comes from and so you're able to wash your hands wash your face if you need to wash your clothing so once again the root makes a really great soap or shampoo. If there's one plant that wins, you know, the most useful plant in the desert, it's gonna be the yucca, particularly the Spanish dagger right here. As for the most abundant of desert plants is gonna be this one right here. This is the creosote and it is all around us. It is around year round. This is an expert in surviving in drought-like conditions, very high heat, very low moisture. It is green year-round, though of course after the rains it'll get even poofier, a lot more darker green. And what this plant provides you is hygiene. It doesn't give you any food source or anything edible like that. However, hygiene is an extremely underrated and overlooked concept of survival and it's something that to take uh, to notice. So first things first, this plant is going to be an excellent insect repellent. This thing if you burn it, put it over your fire, it's going to help get these bugs away from you. And that's one thing that's just abundant out here during this, the warm months is flies and mosquitoes and stuff like that. And they're very annoying and they, they spread germs. Of course, they spread bacteria, stuff like that. So you break off a piece and you burn it and it'll make this thick smoke. Now, obviously, this isn't, you know, they're going to be the same as, you know, putting it over a fire. But you can see the smoke right there and that repels insects so it'll provide you some relief from the stinging bites of mosquitoes in the summer nights and stuff like that not only that but this plant does have some antimicrobial properties as well so if you don't have access to a shower you're say you're out here in the military something like that you can give yourself a smoke bath kind of let this seep into your clothes your skin stuff like that and it kills bacteria that makes you stinky you know stuff like that so give yourself a quick smoke bath you know, cleanse yourself a little bit. Possibly, you know, I'm not a spiritual person, but I'm sure this was viewed in some form, you know, as like smudging. So if you're into that kind of stuff, I'm sure this will help. Once again, this also helps repel bugs that carry, you know, diseases and germs such as flies. So this is gonna be useful once again, in terms of hygiene. Not only that, but this plant makes that beautiful desert rain smell. And if you live in the desert, you know what I'm talking about. Desert rain has a particularly very pleasing smell. And so the way this plant retains its moisture during the hot summer days is because it provides, it makes some little wax on its, on its leaves. And when you mix that wax with rainwater, it makes that beautiful desert rain smell. I hope you guys like that acting because I have no sense of smell whatsoever. So I don't know what it smells like to be completely honest. However, I do know for a fact that this is what causes that desert rain smell. And you can use this as a scrub. Now don't scrub, it is a rough plant so you don't wanna to be too harsh. But say you do have water out here in the desert and you don't have a scrub to scrub your arms, stuff like that. This does have, once again, antibacterial properties and you, you know this will help get debris and mud and stuff like that sweat off of you. 
just go nice and slow, nice and soft, because this plant does not have spines. And spines and thorns are everywhere out here in the desert, so this is one of the few that doesn't have that. So once again, not only will this help clean you up, but it provides this very beautiful desert rain smell. Next, let's go ahead and talk about the agave plant. Now this right here is called the lechuguilla. It is a unique agave species found only in the Chihuahuan Desert out here in West Texas. But there are many species of agave found throughout the American Southwest. Now the agave's claim to fame is that they make booze out of it. They make tequila, they make mezcal, pulque from it. But there are some uses in terms of survival. So first things first, it is edible, the heart or the core of it. You remove all these spikes, you remove the stalk and get to the very base of it, and you can eat that. Now you cannot eat that raw, you will get sick. You need to cook that so you can transform the complex starches into sugars. Now, even with a modern day appliance like a modern day oven, it's still gonna take about a damn day. So I haven't done it, it sounds extremely long and tedious, but keep your eyes peeled, I will get a video on that filmed next year. But it is, from what I hear, very sweet. Once you, once you bake it, it's, it's a very sweet treat. And not only that, but this plant, you can see all these, this little base of spikes. This is confused often with a yucca plant, and for good reason, it does resemble one. And even some of the uses re are gonna resemble yucca that we're about to talk about, but it is in fact not related. Now, these spikes, just like the yucca spikes, you can turn into cordage, so you can, Remove these, cut these off, you know, pound them down, remove the outer skin, and then you got strings that you could start, you know, weaving together to make some cordage. Or you could take it one step further, and you see the tips, these gnarly needle tips, keep the needle, and then just start processing the base of the plant, the strings, and you got yourself a needle and thread. So you can do some repairs on clothing, stitch two tarps together. And then last of all, we do have these stalks. So these agaves, once they start flowering, they grow this very tall stalk, once again, very similar to a yucca. And you can use these for shelter building. Now, this is a short-term shelter. If you're looking to make a long-term desert shelter, I wouldn't suggest you using these because they start breaking down fairly quickly. They, they start becoming brittle within a year, becoming hollow. You know, I really wouldn't recommend if you're, once again, if you're looking to make something that's gonna be standing the test of time, but for one night, two, as I did recently, you're gonna be just fine. A week, you're gonna be just fine. But other than that, it's just not gonna last a long time. However, the inside is very spongy, very pithy. You can make this stuff into some chart tinder, so very similar to char cloth, and that's something of a woodsman's cheat if you don't know what it is. Uh, it just helps secure an ember so you can get that fire going. I have done that with agave stalks before as well. And I almost forgot, just like the yucca, the dying little pieces at the bottom, the dying stalks that are falling apart, make an excellent tinder bundle because they're just very stringy and dry. So this will catch very easily. And I'm just gonna demonstrate. Now it is very windy right now, so it may be a little bit of a problem, but yeah, just gonna show it. Just, you wanna break it down. See if I can get it going. Oh yeah, look at that. Very easily. So that's another use right there. Now, if you find yourself by a local water source, such as the Rio Grande River, canals, lakes, so on and so forth, you'll run into this plant right here called the wolfberry plant. Now, being the fact that we are in the desert, water sources are somewhat rare, making this plant somewhat rare, but they can be found throughout the Southwest. In fact, I believe there's about 35 different subspecies of wolfberry plants from Texas all the way up to California. The ones in my area are called Tori's Wolfberry, and these are delicious during the early summer months. These sprout some vibrant red little berries, and they are in the nightshade family. They are related to tomatoes, and you can taste the familiarity of tomatoes. They, they taste like ketchup to me, just without that vinegar aftertaste of ketchup. Now, as always, if you're gonna emulate this Practice caution, don't be so eager to make a mistake. Make sure you know what you're looking for. Now, the bushes themselves grow long, thin stems like this. And the leaves grow in clusters of three and they are oval. They resemble rabbit ears to me at least. And then they'll, you'll see little green fruits that eventually ripen to be this brilliant red right here. 
Really good stuff. Once again, they grow early summer, like around May to June, and they won't last long. The birds, the rabbits, they love this stuff. And for good reason, it's, it's delicious and it's plentiful. You can just gather them right off the branch the way I like to do, or you can just gather a good amount of them, take them home so you can make them into a jam or leave them to dry to make little teas and stuff like that. Uh, just be sure as always with all these wild edibles to do not get greedy because of course the wildlife depends on this stuff. So don't take too much, make sure there's, you know, still enough, but I definitely would recommend this plant. Uh, it's delicious, it's plentiful during early summer months, and it's one of the few plants that doesn't have as severe thorns. Some of these species do still have a little bit of thorns, but not as bad as prickly pear, for example. Now, just like the wolfberry, if you find yourself by a source of water such as this lake or the river, a stream, canals, even some ditches that hold some water, you're gonna run across the cattail plant. These things are abundant, they're everywhere. These are famous in meme culture on the internet because they resemble like a corn dog. So a lot of people are like, oh look, a wild corn dog. Now these plants, once again, they grow by water. A ton of them, they're everywhere. Now we are already in early autumn, so they're already starting to yellow. Look at all this entire wall behind me. They grow up to eight, nine feet tall. And these are it, these are the cattails. Now, just be sure if you're gonna mess around with any of these, make sure that you know for a fact that these are in fact cattails. There's a look-alike called the iris that is toxic, so just be careful. But the iris does not grow these flower heads. So as long as you see this, you'll know for a fact you're looking at cattails. Now, the first use of cattails is it is a food source. If you dig up the roots, they are full of starch. That's energy right there. So you can go ahead and consume that. Also the young shoots, those are my favorite. At the very base of the stalk, you go ahead and remove all these outer layers, all these outer leaves, and the inside's gonna be a bright white tuber. Very soft, very tender. You can even eat that raw. I would suggest you caramelize it over some coals and it gives it a little bit of flavor, kind of like grilled onions. Just be careful. These cattails, they grow in all kinds of water, and if the water's you know, disgusting, full of pollutants, you don't wanna mess with that, so just make sure that the, the cattails are in a relatively safe place. And then once you cook them, of course, that cooking them is gonna kill the rest of the protozoan bacteria that they may have. Now, another use for them as well in terms of food is when they start growing in the early springtime. This one's already mature, but when it's a little bit younger, uh, they do have pollen. You can collect that pollen and use that as a flower substitute. I have seen some people make some cattail pancakes out of that. Also, at the base of the stem, as you start separating them, you do have a little bit of medicinal value there. Just like the cactus slime that we talked about earlier, these also have a slime. And they, of course, are the same thing. The, the little bit of an analgesic, you know, if you do have a slight scrape, bug bite, sunburns, you rub that on the wound and it'll just provide you a little bit of relief as well. So not only food, but also a little bit of first aid. And then another one, the one that I use it the most, is these mature flower stalks are a flash tinder source. Now, a flash tinder source, just like it sounds, it's a, it's a form of fire, but it's gonna be quick. So you gotta just, you know, if you're low on supplies, you're down to your last match, and you need to get a fire going, this is gonna help you kind of spread that flame a little bit to help you get the fire going. One thing I suggest though is of course, have all your materials for your fire ready to go because it's a flash tinder, meaning in a flash it's gonna be gone. But let me show you how that works. This is really cool. Scrape this off. <laughs> so once again, in an emergency that can help you spread that around your tender bundle, around the twigs that you're trying to catch, and it'll help. Now in a really bad situation, you're out here stranded during a winter storm, something like that, and you are really cold, this also works as a down as well. So you can stuff this in under your shirt, in between the layers of your clothing, and it'll help keep you warm. Now, just so you know, before we, before you try that, this stuff gets everywhere and it is a pain to get rid of. So, you know, you get rescued, you take that coat to the dry cleaners because that thing's just gonna be just all over the place. And then last of all, this is something that I have not tried yet, just like the yucca, but you can use these long shoots and natives used to use these for weaving, weaving baskets, weaving hats, that kind of stuff. So a food source, a slight first aid relief, 
weaving to craft projects like a hat once again and a flash tinder so cattails if you're by the water you're gonna run into these Now right here we have ourselves another member of the cactus family. This is the Tasajillo or the Christmas cactus. Now this one is a lot less abundant than the prickly pear. It's also a lot more subtle. It's shorter and it doesn't stand out as much. And the, an easy way to distinguish them is the long stems with the very thin spines. Now if you notice closely there's some little slight reddish bulbs growing on them. And that's because we're in early autumn. In about two, three months from now, it's gonna be December, January, and those are gonna be a little bit bigger and bright red little bulbs. And that's gonna be a fruit source that's found out here during the winter time. So around winter, they're nice and plentiful and they're pretty tasty. And it's a lean time for the wildlife out here, so it's a food source. And if you're out here, of course, it's gonna provide some sustenance for you too. Just be careful because they do have glochids, those small hair-like little spines. You don't want them in your lip or your tongue or anything like that. So be sure to gather these with a stick or rocks or your multi-tool. Of course, roast them or roll them in fire or something like that. And then um, from there, you can consume them. And they taste like sweet little tomatoes. So it's not a big abundant food source like prickly pear is during their, the prime of their season. But you know, it'll feed you during lean, cold times. As for the rarest of the wild desert edibles in my area, that's gonna go to the Texas Madrone tree and the berries that grow from that tree. Now, the Texas Madrone tree, I have only found in the Guadalupe Mountains of West Texas. There are many subspecies of Madrone tree, but the Texas Madrone may only grow in that area. I could be mistaken, but I've only found it there. Now, during the winter months, this tree grows a ton of vibrant red berries. They taste very good, quite tart, good stuff. Now this tree has a very smooth bark and green leaves, very pretty. And those berries grow in November, December, so it's a wintertime meal, very delicious, good eating. Not only that, but the bark starts to peel off and you can take strips of those peeled bark and make it into a tea. Traditionally, the bark tea was made to treat sore throats. I will say it is quite bitter. It tastes something like Earl Grey. So if you're not into bitter teas, I, I would just generally avoid it, but it can be pretty soothing during a harsh winter months and you, you know, you're a little under the weather. And once again, those berries are very delicious, a really good food source for the winter time as well. And the last one is my personal favorite. This is the mesquite tree. One of the very few trees we have out here in the deserts of West Texas. Now mesquite is pretty famous in pop culture when it comes to barbecue and grilling because the wood is very twisted and dense. It burns very hot for a long time and it provides a very smoky flavor to the food you're cooking, very delicious. So it is a wood for cooking. It's also great for staying warm. So if you're out here camping during the winter time, Mesquite wood is very twisted and stubborn. It takes a long time to burn away fully. So it burns very hot, very bright for a long time. You can tell the difference between a mesquite fire and some soft wood, such as a pine fire, for example. It's gonna burn away much faster, much less warmer. So it's a great wood for staying warm in winter time. And then of course the, the main claim to fame out here when it comes to survival is it is a food source. So first things first, check out the leaves, how they look. And just be very careful when you're walking around an area that has mesquite plants or if you're driving around here because these branches have some very gnarly thorns. Check this one out that I found not so far from here. I mean, check out the size of my pinky. It's almost as long as it. So some very gnarly thorns, be careful with that. Now, my favorite aspect of the mesquite is the fact that it is a food source during the summertime. And it's a, sadly a very forgotten food source that was a staple out here in this region centuries ago. So during the summer months, these grow some bean pods and those bean pods, once they ripen, they're like a cream color with modeled with some maroon on them. I do have a jar of mesquite bean pods because there's a lot of uses for these. So I brought these from home. This is how they look. And like I said, if they're mature and you, you 
pull it off the tree. You can't eat it as such. Pretty sweet, kind of like tamarind. Just remember to spit out the seed and eat the rest. So you can eat it raw or you can take it home and there's a lot of recipes you could do with this. So one of the things we've done out here in the desert is grind these down into a powder with the mortar and pestle, something like a flour substitute, mix it with some water and you can make something like little survival cakes out here. Pretty tasty, very sweet. And those are pretty good. I've also roasted these, broken them down, roasted them over a cast iron as if I'm making coffee beans. And then I've made some coffee substitute with them as well. Pretty delicious. Now it does not contain caffeine, but it is sweet. It is pretty good. So it'll still give you a little bit of a kick. There's other things you can do with these. I've seen people make mesquite jellies and candies and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of versatilities, very healthy, nutrient dense food that sadly has been forgotten due time. If there's one plant here that I wish would kind of make a comeback in modern day markets and stuff, it's mesquite, at least like mesquite flowers and stuff like that, mesquite jellies and syrup. If you're out here during the summertime, just gather some. You can take them home. Once again, make some coffee, make some cakes, uh, mix it with your flour, stuff like that. So the mesquite tree. Well, that's about it for me, folks. Just a handful of plants that I know out here that provide certain uses such as food, first aid, soap, crafting, shelter, and I'm sure I'm even leaving out other details that I'm not even aware about. Also, did I miss any plants? I mean, there's many more out here that I'm not aware of that have plenty of uses. So let's get a conversation down in the comments section because there's not enough information when it comes to desert survival, the flora, the fauna, all that good stuff. Also, if you do decide to get out here and try to emulate some of the stuff, taste some of the wild food, all that, just be sure to be respectful. Don't take too much. The wildlife depends on the food out here. And don't leave a mess. Don't be disrespectful. Be breaking things and so on and so forth. Let's respect nature. And with that being said, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. It did take us many weeks to film this video in different areas. Get home, piece it together, plus 10 years of trial and error and research getting out here and enjoying nature and I'm really hoping to share that with you guys so if you could give us a thumbs up let's try to push it to a thousand likes on this video if possible also if you are new here please subscribe we are this close to 98,000 subscribers I'm hoping to hit 100,000 by the end of the year so if you enjoy desert bushcraft camping fishing foraging great music we have that in spades here at Junkyard Fox and then with that being said I'll see you guys next week with another video. Now go outside and get your boots dirty.